let me just uh, make sure I have everything ready because um, even for me, these uh, 10 minutes are rather tight and I can easily imagine situations where uh, I will run out of time if I'm not uh, conscious about how much time I spend. So, so with that, let me do multiple choice. I think, um, I, well, let me first to do one and I'm just uh, debating with myself internally if I should do it more than once. I think once is enough. Uh, let me do at least once. Okay, so let me start and uh, I'm just watching my clock so that I know. But I think something changed. Yeah, when I scroll down, there's a mini clock. I don't know if that was always there, but um, I can watch that now. Okay, so um, yeah, yeah, I've read the rules. Okay, so 10 questions, uh, 10 minutes. So, um, and uh, I think by now about half of the questions should be coming from um, questions I use in physics 10. So they are not as difficult as um, what questions written for calculus based general physics might be, but um, in for this class, the challenge would be that it's not the, uh, in physics 10, students actually have seen their questions before uh, when they're working on homework, but for this class, you know, when you see this, it might be the first time you are seeing this particular version of the, the wording, so. Correctly defined or describes torque. Um, with a greater level arm, a given for yeah, that comes directly from the definition of torque. Um, definition of torque that um, says that force is level arm times uh, torque is level arm times a force, or, or you can also express it in terms of cross product. Uh, not necessary for this question. The rest are, I think, a common misconceptions about force. Um, well, these two are common, uh, or this is a common misconception about force, just rephrased in the context of torque. Okay, uh, which of the following is the correct formula for rotational kinetic energy? Ah. So this is, uh, I think uh, in the lectures, you see me um, highlight what what's called the rotational analogy. It's the idea, it's the design feature that if you have an equation like kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared, the quantities we define rotationally, like a rotational inertia, we define it so that you can get the rotational version of these expressions simply by changing these to the rotational versions. So the rotational version of one half, so one half, mass, rotation inertia, speed, angular speed, so that's this one. Um, yeah, okay, I gotta go faster. Okay, question three, consider two curved ramps shown below, you know, rubbers, so different friction coefficients um, with the, uh, yeah, here rolls without slipping, it slides with the negligible friction or still. So the interesting thing here is that at the bottom uh, in part A, the still ball would have both the translational and rotational kinetic energy. And that leads to the translational kinetic energy here being less. So I think uh, um, what it comes down to is, yeah, with which ramp does the still ball have greater range? Which one is it launched at a greater speed? It should be here where it's only sliding, not rotating. So greater amount of initial energy goes into translational kinetic energy. So has greater range, yeah. And I think these choices are deliberately written in a kind of a dense way. I'm trying to give you the least uh, convincing reason <laughs> for the correct answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think the radius actually cancels out when you do the derivation. It's kind of fun um, thing. Okay, uh, bicycle wheel on an axle is made to rotate. Oh yeah, precession. Um, I think you have some lecture videos that demonstrate precession. Some of you got to play with the bicycle wheel in class last week's lab. Um, now, here's a, a question I like to ask because once you are able to get this question right and you are convinced it's right, it, demonst it should demonstrate to you that you understand the phenomenon of precession and that's why I want to do that estimate. It's uh, this one, a uh, slower spinning bicycle will precesses faster. <laughs> if I have time at the end of the, this session, I'll get to uh, actually drive in quantitative expression for that. I think the 
Restar. Well, yeah. Okay. Can I go faster? Uh, helicopter takes up by spinning. Uh, let me just zoom out a little bit. I I don't nothing a whole question and all right. All right. It's, um yeah. These have no such tail rotor, which uh, other on the oh. So these are counter rotating. They rotate in opposite directions. And actually, uh, to me, it's been yeah. And actually, quadcopters can do more elaborate uh, maneuvers just by adjusting how its a four uh, propellers. Uh, rotate. It's kind of uh, interesting the kind of maneuvers that quadcopters can do because they have four rotating main rotors. Considering the manual angular monitor, the specify system not conserved. So, for conservation of, uh, I'll just say that a lot. The writing takes longer. Um, conservation of angular momentum. You have the version of conservation of momentum condition. For momentum to be conserved, you basically need something like external force being zero or net external force being zero. So for conservation of angular momentum, you need net external torque being zero. Uh, there's a bit of a small correction for that, but I'll leave that for the lecture um, that you might have seen. <laughs> so I'm looking for a situation where there is a non-zero net external torque. This jumping thing, um, it, there's only gravity, which isn't producing any torque, so angular momentum should be conserved. Free session, interestingly, uh, angular momentum isn't conserved because gravitational force is applying a torque about the support point. So the rest, I think, uh, angular momentum is conserved. Um, a carpenter's ladder leans against the wall, even though mm -hmm. yeah, she climbs and she finds that the ladder will slip out on her. So, yeah, okay. Why is the question so long? Just the same that most correctly, okay, physics the situation. Leather will slide on. When the wall pushes the leather with a greater force than the static, yeah, that's right. Uh, for static equilibrium, the left toward the force has to be balanced uh, by the right toward the friction force. When that doesn't happen anymore, yeah, that's when it slides. That's when the friction fails. Uh, this is, again, uh, deliberately stated in a really dense way um, so that People don't automatically think, oh, that sounds like a right answer. Interesting. The rest, um, like friction force between the leather and the floor, uh, it actually remains constant um, or increases if it's a static friction. Um, it doesn't decrease. And uh, and uh, I think when you do the derivation for this setup, G cancels out. So what planet you are on doesn't matter. Although, you know, less gravity, maybe it's safer when you fall the same distance. Um, yeah, the, the, it's more of the location of the mass that matters, not the amount of the mass. Okay, um, now this question I'm going to skip for now and I'll come back and I will tell you um, how it's reasonable to put this on an assessment where I'm expecting you to do one question a minute. Um, uh, when a satellite is in a geosynchronous orbit, okay, I'll come back to this as well. Okay, this one seems more qualitative. I can do this more quickly. Okay, prepare them for uh, sensing when I said, okay, most to correct the statement below. Uh, Lana and Cyril feel way less poor because I, uh, no. Uh, so, force of acceleration is not a thing. So, they skydiving is different because then there's an air resistance. Um, oh, yeah, this is actually right because their distance from center of Earth really changes very minimally. And this is altitude. You have to add uh, the radius of the Earth, which is much greater than any of these numbers. Um, yeah, these, the rest are wrong. Okay, so I have a minute and a half, and I will give show you a demonstrative technique that will allow you to answer a question like this in like 30 seconds, which is, that um, some of the answers are just to, they look wrong. Like this, F equals MGR, it's just wrong because the units are wrong. Uh, MG itself already has a unit of Newton. You multiply it by meter, it's not a unit of force at all. So looking at that, so this is not an answer. This is not an answer. I eliminated two already. Uh, let's see here. I think this is also not an answer. Because I have mg, and then these combinations don't cancel out a unitless quantity. So I'm really um, choosing between these two. And um, here it says greater r will lead to greater force. 
So uh, that should sound conceptually wrong. Here, greater R maybe doesn't lead to greater F. So I'm going to choose this. Okay, I have 30 seconds. Here, um, I think I have the answer actually memorized. I think it's approximately 40 kilometers. Um, if I were <laughs> explaining these things, I might not have run out of time, but uh, I definitely can't plug in the numbers in, um, in the remaining 10 seconds or so. Let me just do that. And uh, after the time runs out, I'll come back and actually do this uh, question nine calculation. It should be a fairly doable, but um, well, here I'm using memorized answer, um, which hopefully was correct. <laughs> now, um, this is how you'd work it out. So with the you know, geosynchronous orbit, it might be a quantity that you have seen, heard somewhere. Um, so, and these numbers are far enough apart that, um, that um, you know, you can actually rule out quite a few uh, choices, like six kilometer, that's like within the atmosphere. So that uh, I think uh, this can be ruled out on that basis. Um, and I guess depending on if you have seen the numbers before or not, maybe between these three, you might be guessing randomly. Um, in fact, when I was writing the question, I thought 80 was the right answer. Then I looked it up and realized it wasn't. So if you had to do this calculation from scratch, this is how you would do it. So when you have, uh, and you know, by the way, doing this derivation from scratch will definitely take longer than a minute. So uh, again, I recommend that you do this at the very end of your set so that if you run out of time here, it affects just that one question. So I have Earth, so imagine a satellite in orbit, just above the equator. So we are looking for a geosynchronous orbit, which means the period of that satellite is one day. And uh, it's a circular orbit. And whenever you have something moving in circle, the number one thing to recognize and work with is that it's accelerating. It's undergoing centripetal acceleration. That's equal to mv squared over r. So, um, and now that we've covered Newton's law of universal gravitation, um, you have another way to write this acceleration. So it's the gravity that's providing centripetal acceleration. So this acceleration should be one over mass times the gravitational force, which is given by G times the product of Earth mass times the satellite mass divided by uh, the distance squared. Some things cancel out. Um, this satellite mass cancels out that satellite mass. So on the right hand side, I only have these. Good. Um, and oh, sorry, um, it's not mv, v squared over r, because I'm writing for acceleration, not centripetal force. Centripetal force is mv squared over r, dividing m gives you just v squared over r. Okay, um, so yeah, I have this left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. And um, you are not given velocity directly, and I think uh, v and r are the only unknowns. And um, so I need to... Figure out if there's something else I can write down for V. And after some time of thinking, hopefully not too long, um, you can say, oh, speed is a total distance uh, per time. So I know I have a constraint on the orbital parameter. It should take the satellite one day to orbit the Earth, orbit its uh, um, travel its orbital distance. The orbital distance is 2 pi r, amount of time is one day. So plug it in there. So you have um, um, so v squared over r is equal to g times me over r squared. I'm just copying that over. Uh, let me solve for r. Some things cancel out. And solving for r, I get r is equal to, you know, move r over, move v squared over, g times me over v squared. And I think I'm going to get as far as here for manual algebra. And I'm just going to plug in the rest of the numbers. And um, as the rules say, um, 
the online calculators are allowed, as long as you are using it in their calculator capacity. So in their ca calculator capacity, <laughs> I'm calculating G times uh, mass of Earth, uh, and which I give it here, actually. I can use just regular calculator. And using this mainly so that I don't have to do the day to seconds conversion. Uh, divided by the V, which would be two times, oh, wait, 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 sorry. Um, I can't do this. Um, yeah, as I was saying, uh, this thing takes a little bit of time. Sorry, I made a mistake. Um, because the expression for V includes expression for R. This whole thing that I was trying to do, uh, you can't do it. That'll give you a kind of in incomplete expression. You actually do have to plug this in and actually solve for R all over again. So <laughs> let me do that. So V squared, that's going to be um, 2 pi squared, R squared, divided by 1 day squared. You actually have to do that so that I can actually work out the R. Um, so I have R squared here. Move R over. It's going to be R to the third power. Yeah. Yeah, that's why <laughs> during the assessment, I relied on my memorized answer. Wasn't trying to work this out in 10 seconds. So on the left-hand side, I'm going to have r to the cube, uh, r, r to the third power. On the right-hand side, so I'm not, uh, I'm working with this left-hand side and this right-hand side. I'm moving two pi squared over one day squared to the right-hand side. So I have g times mass of the earth times one day squared on the numerator divided by two pi squared on the denominator. Okay, so I can take this whole thing and take it to the one third root. So let me do that calculation on the from alpha. So I have g times mass of the earth times one day squared divided by two pi squared, make sure to have parentheses in the right places so that um, group expressions are grouped correctly together. This whole thing raised to the power of one third for the cube root. So when you do that, one of the checks that your um, answer is right is that it comes out in right units. It should come out in the units of length. Um, so I have yeah, meters or 40 or so kilometers. And does this recognize it as, um, oh, doesn't recognize it as a, a geosynchronous orbital distance. Well, anyways, um, the, that would be the answer. Um, and it, it, I think it's uh, worth repeating the usual uh, test taking advice because uh, it's uh, the um, it, it's the limitation of. Um, assessment format like uh, multiple choice, which is that uh, there are ways where you can perform better than your actual knowledge might reflect. So, you know, I answered this correctly, mostly relying on memorized number. And uh, so the fact that I answered this correctly didn't actually reflect that I could do all this in one minute. And frankly, when I put in questions into the multiple choice, um, my expectation and hope is that you will use the same techniques that I use, use good test taking strategy. So uh, if you don't happen to have this number memorized, then the best plan B is to actually skip it. You know, use that minute for something else where you can actually accomplish something in that time, not, you know, waste that time and more on this one question, which takes quite a bit of time, as you've seen me spend however many minutes on this <laughs> one question right now. Even without explanation, I think it would have taken me over a minute just writing out all the expressions and making sure I don't make the mistake that I almost made. Um, I think so. So with that note, uh, let me start the free from time assessment. I think uh, the question pool has maybe five questions. I forget the exact number, but in any case, um, once you start, you will see your question and you will have 20 minutes to answer it. And as before, um, you have add work feature and the, really the design is that 20 minutes are 
what you're spending working out the answer and what you put in as the answer is um, uh, most of the times it's just your final answer. Um, you don't have to go into detailed work, which, you know, you should go into the uh, material that you will add as added work um, without a time limit. So uh, with that, let me start. I have 20 minutes, maybe, <laughs> once I start. Um, so it says, oh, okay, this is fun one. Uh, so this is just the, the collection of uh, static equilibrium situations. Uh, by the way, this particular question has... um two different versions programmed in. So just because you see this description at the top, don't assume what you get as question will be the same. They may be different. So, so okay, uh, let me just work through here. So I'm told to work this out as a static. So these are the static equilibrium conditions. Uh, these two are uh, many. Okay, for each of the questions below, keep an organized record over your work and attach it at the end. Okay, yeah, that's what I'm going to do here. Um, okay, it says, uh, consider a standard hand holding a meter stick by the end as shown in the diagram below. Uh, I'm just going to sketch a quick free body diagram. So as you, you are getting into static equilibrium, your object for free body diagram can no longer be represented as a single point because where you apply the force begins to matter for the torque. So uh, it says simplify the contact forces as the thumb holding the ruler from below. I guess that's what it does. Um, yeah. So that means I have this upward force here. Let me call it F thumb. Um, and the pinky end of the hand preventing the ruler from tipping over. Yeah. So from this portion, there's going to be a downward force, FP. And a pinky. Uh, if the fist, okay, so I'm given the some kind of width here and the weight of the ruler. Oh, so I need to locate where the, um, the gravitational force on the ruler will be. And I think I uh, mentioned this uh, special property of center of mass, which is that when it comes to gravitational forces, you can treat the kind of overall gravitational force on an expand, extended body like this meter stick. Um, so, you know, it's actually extended, you know, the gravitational force is spread throughout the entire thing. It's not something that you can associate with a single point. But the special thing about center of mass is uh, you can treat it that way. You can say, okay, given this center of mass, let's say I have a gravitational force, the weight of the ruler um, that that's actually spread uh, throughout the thing. Um, but using center of mass as the point where the force acts as a force acting on a single point, um, it'll give you the right answers. So. Okay, it asks, what are the magnitudes of the forces exerted by the thumb and the pinky on the ruler? It says, assume that the center of the mass of the ruler is at its midpoint. Yeah, so I think that's essentially giving me a number. Oh, I guess they have given me numbers so far. So the width of the hand is 10 centimeters or 0 0.1 meter. And um, this distance would be half of a meter or 0 0.5 meter. Um, okay, magnitude of forces exerted by the thumb and the pinky on the ruler. Well, um, I think the thing to do here, because the question mentions force, is a standard strategy. So let me just employ standard strategy. Um, I've drawn free body diagram. I can define axis, but uh, here everything's either, well, everything is actually vertical. So um, I don't really have to define axis. Also acceleration is zero because it's a static equilibrium. Um, so those are step two. Step three, um, uh, decompose the forces into components along the axis. They are all vertical, so no decomposing necessary. Four, write down Newton's second law equations. So you have this Newton's second law equation that uh, all the forces added together, these three forces, will add up to zero if it's in static equilibrium. So net force, which is the upward uh, thumb force minus the downward pinky force. Is that right? 
Yeah, I guess it's right. <laughs> uh, and uh, again, downward weight, uh, and I'm giving the uh, weight directly, yeah, minus the weight of the ruler, uh, they add up to zero. And if you're looking at just this Newton's second law, I hope you realize that you have one, two unknowns and only one equation. Uh, it's not solvable. This is where you need a second condition for static equilibrium, that net torque is also equal to zero. So you write down the net torque equation. We say net torque, um, and um, I have to be careful, so I'm going to go with... Um, so uh, let me use this as my center of rotation. This way I don't have to worry about the torque due to the pinky force. So I have the thumb force that will tend to rotate things counterclockwise. I have the weight of the ruler which will tend to rotate things clockwise. Um, and yeah, and I have the lever arm here. This is the lever arm for FT and um, and I think this is uh, what I would use as a lever arm for this force from the pivot to the where the force is acting in a perpendicular direction. Okay, so let me write that out. Um, the lever arm times the thumb force, that would be the width times the thumb force going counterclockwise. Um, I'm gonna say counterclockwise direction, that's my positive direction. And then this clockwise rotation is the negative um, direction. So let me put the sign here, minus um, the, the point at which the lever arm for the force acting there. So minus L times the amount of force acting at that point. Uh, I think they're giving us the weight directly. Yeah, so weight of the ruler. Okay, so in uh, all of this is equal to zero. So in writing this second equation, I haven't... Um, Introduce any new unknowns. This W, it's a known, it's already there. The, the thumb force that's already counted there. The, uh, the length of the ruler, well, the uh, length of the ruler, yeah, not quite length of the ruler, this is the distance here. That's uh, half of the ruler's this, um, length um, minus the, um, minus the, uh, work being done by, sorry, I'm losing track of what I'm doing. So, uh, weight of the ruler, oh, which is a given quantity, yeah. So I have one, two uh, unknowns. So two unknowns, two equations, it's solvable. So let's do this. I think I can actually solve this uh, uh, for the uh, thumb force just directly. So my thumb force is, is equal to, uh, uh, level arm for the weight of the ruler times weight of the ruler divided by the um, width, not weight, width of the uh, fist. And that's it. Um, now, this is already an expression for thumb force in terms of everything else known. So um, I can just plug this in here and solve for the, uh, the pinky force. And the pinky force is equal to the thumb force, I'm just staring at it, doing the algebra in my head, um, minus the weight of the ruler. Yeah. So uh, let me do this. I'm going to write down, okay, my thumb force is equal to the the length uh, or, um, well, I'll just write down L times uh, weight of the ruler divided by the width um, or <laughs> just the explanation lever arm for thumb force times the weight of ruler uh, divided by uh, width of a fist. And given that value, um, I can calculate the pinky force as the thumb force minus the, the weight of the ruler. And while this might not be the most uh, ideal answer, especially if you are running short on time, um, this is uh, something that will probably get full credit because uh, uh, it's showing that you understand all the pieces, especially combined with this. 
Now, the, they are giving us these numerical values, intending that we will actually use it to get actual forces. So let's do that. Um, so the L, that's 0 0.5 meter, times the weight of the roller, that's uh, 1 newton, uh, divided by the, the width of the fist, 10 centimeters, or 0 0.1 meter. So uh, 5 newtons is the amount of force for the thumb force. If this is uh, 5 newtons. And plugging that in here, uh, 5 newtons minus 1 newton, the pinky force is uh, 1 newton. And these are quite uh, large forces compared to the weight of the ruler. It's, uh, it's kind of a common thing in a biomechanical setting where the amount of force your muscles have to exert is um, uh, some multiples greater than what amount of force you might have to exert if you're directly lifting it uh, without torque being involved. So, okay, I gotta go a little faster so I might skip out on some of the explanations. <laughs> so here, um, yeah, so I think I just do this. I think I'm also falling asleep a little bit and it always gets worse when I'm speaking nonstop. I think it's uh, not as, as much falling asleep as just uh, me running out of oxygen and uh, starting to lose consciousness. Um, so uh, let me start out with a free body diagram. So, <laughs> um, so I have this applied force, which is, I guess, acting here, um, applied at that. I'm just not going to uh, have this in my diagram because I prefer to free body, draw free body diagrams where the tail is at the point to where the force is acting. Okay. Um, I think there's going to be, so asking myself the question, did I draw all the forces? This um, does not look like the net torque is equal to zero. Uh, also, I haven't drawn gravity yet. So let me uh, start by drawing the gravity first because there's always gravity. And having drawn these two, um, so I think I have a, an issue with the net force uh, because vertically they should add up to zero. So there should be a normal force from below. Now, the interesting question here is where should we place the normal force? Because there's now an entire surface of contact. And um, turns out this is what you need to, uh, what you have to place carefully in order to make the net torque, net torque come out to zero. Because if uh, this uh, normal force is way over here, then, um, then it'll be generating too much clockwise torque. And you can kind of imagine here, as you increase and increase the applied force, the amount of clock, so uh, I'm going to just use the point that I think the rotation will happen around as my pivot point, my center of rotation. So by applying the forces, applying on clockwise torque, my gravity is applying counterclockwise torque. So when the normal force is over here, it's uh, applying a clockwise force, uh, which could be troublesome. Uh, so um, it could cause this to tip over. So as I apply and apply, increase the apply the force, um, this normal force, it can't decrease in magnitude because it has to still balance out the mg. So uh, it's going to, uh, so this normal force will uh, really have to act over here. Okay, I might have to just to skip with all the explanations because I only have six minutes and I think, uh, I can barely finish it in six minutes if I don't explain anything. Um, yeah, so let me do that. I'm just going to work out an answer for this apply the force. So the, uh, or the, the equation I'm working with is network uh, lever arm times the apply the force. Um, I'm going to say this is positive. So minus the counterclockwise, um, that would be half of the width times the mg um do i have the expression for m make the box slide oh so i'm actually given f 
so what this f should be is the normal force times mu n or it's going to be mu mg yeah so the idea is that this uh, mill cancel out that uh, this whole thing is equal to zero okay so i think i have an expression for h um, h is equal to uh, w over 2 times g over um, and just looking at here oh wait g is cancelled out too. Uh, so w over 2 um, divided by mu with divided by 2 um, mu moved over yeah I'm, you know, doing much of the algebra in my head. So <laughs> the maximum height where you can push and push with the, the enough force to do this and not have it tip over is a width of the box divided by two, um, divided by mu. And uh, check the unit. Uh, left hand side should be unit of length. Right hand side is unit of length. And uh, see work attached. Uh, I have four more minutes remaining, so let me just uh, do this without much explanation so that I can finish it in time. In physical work, uh, yes, uh, first to find the magnitude of the force, the wall exerts against the ladder is the ladder leans by itself. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start out with a free body diagram. This is the ladder. Um, there's going to be gravity pulling it down. There's going to be normal force pushing it up equal to gravity. Um, this looks like a clockwise rotation using this as uh, center rotation. So I got to have uh, uh, the, the normal force from the wall to balance out these two torques. So net torque is equal to um, Let me label this uh, as the length L. So this is the lever arm for FN's uh, uh, lever arm. So it's going to be, and this is theta. So it'll be L cosine theta times FN minus uh, the lever arm for this is, um, oh, it's also L half. Uh, cosine theta times mg. So uh, all of that has to be equal to zero. So solving for fn, fn is equal to the length of the ladder interestingly cancels. Um, and I have this moved over. Also cosine theta cancels. Oh, I, I guess that's right, yeah. Um, so I have the end result mg divided by 2. Yeah. So that's the magnitude of the force wall exerts against the ladder. Uh, Fn is equal to the weight of the um, ladder divided by 2. Yeah. See attached form. Um, part D. Uh, yeah. If I'm explaining, it'll take me like 10 minutes to do it. So I'm just going to do this quickly a lot of, without a lot of explanation. So, oh wait, is it a conceptual question? Oh no, how much force does the wall? Okay. So, now the new setup is uh, same, you know, theta and all that. Uh, still the same forces that were there. They're still there. They haven't gone away. Um, uh, the force from wall that's still there. The one additional force is the the weight of the carpenter. So there's going to be the normal force that the carpenter exerts at this high point on the ladder. Uh, let me call it weight of the carpenter, um, or that would be the uh, mass of the carpenter times G. Um, so, so yeah, we still impose the same condition that net torque is equal to zero. And the, the these previous two terms we had for net torque, they're still there. L cosine theta times Fn. Uh, that's the counterclockwise torque. And I subtract the two clockwise torques minus um, L over two cosine theta mg. The capital M, the way I'm writing, it's the weight of the ladder. <laughs> minus L cosine theta. Oh, wait, I made a mistake. 
think this should have been sine theta. I'll fix it in the attached work. So here, just gonna type in something so that I have something um, plus L, no, uh, MC times G. <laughs> I'm doing this so that there's something entered there um, within the time limit. This is sort of what I'm recommending that you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, as you are taking the assessment to yourself. So I noticed the slight mistake here um, that I didn't quite have enough time within the time limit to fix. So now with the, the time has run out, I have enough time to organize my work. And any mistakes that you have spotted, I would rather have you fix it than not fix it. So I realized that with this FN, um, or I guess the exact mistake is okay. So um, the the lever arm I was using for FN, that is fine, but I did this too quickly. I, um, I um, mistook the directions of FN and the MG. So with the MG, this is my lever arm. So this is the L over two sine theta. So that's what I should have done. So this is sine theta which it means uh, thetas don't cancel. And this Fn here should be mg sine theta over two. And then this cosine theta remained there. It didn't get canceled out. And um, divide by cosine theta. So that's what I should have had for C. And um, I will note that uh, corrected answer for C. And you know, when I graded this, um, I take into account with the attached work there, you had pra practically unlimited time, practically. Um, this was within time limit. So um, it depends on how extensive the corrections are. You know, if it's one of those things that I would have been on the borderline about whether to deduct the points or not, then I see you corrected, then I might not, I might give you full credit. But if uh, what's uh, in the answer portion is very minimal, as in something that I would give you very little point to start out with, then even with the perfect work, um, I, you know, you won't get full credit. So like this part D, um, unless this answer is pretty close to correct, I mean, that's correct unit. <laughs> I might not get full credit here. So uh, let me just finish up part of this so that I at least have finished the work. So let me just, uh, so this should have been L over two sine theta. And I think, yeah, this is a sine theta, uh, MCG. So yeah, it, corresponding to these two level arms. So solving for FN in my head, uh, it's gonna be so else just cancel out, and I have uh, mg sine theta over 2 divided by cosine theta plus um, mcg sine theta no over 2, just the cosine theta. Yeah, so this is the same term as previous. And this is now the new term. The mass of the carpenter forces this normal force to be greater. Um, and oh, explain how the calculations in the the so uh, for the uh, force from while increases as carpenter climbs. So, depending on wall material, uh, yeah, leaned against the weak wall, it may not be able to be increased. Um, FN. Okay. And uh, with the usual reminder, note that you should organize this more than I'm doing now. I'm kind of organizing it very little because to organize this fully will take like an hour and 
okay, maybe not an hour, but it'll take a substantial amount of time that um, <laughs> I'd rather use the remaining um, five minutes working on one of the homework questions than organizing this work that uh, has dubious uh, benefit to people. Uh, people who are here, um, on, uh, people who are here and people who uh, may be watching the recording later. So just uh, copy and paste this as a work. By the way, um, th there's a bit of, there can be a bit of a glitch, especially if you are doing this uh, near the um, uh, due date, uh, you know, midnight on Monday night, um, in that when the that time comes around, I think the system kicks you out over here as well. That uh, even though you have access to save work screen after the due date, at least you should have access. So um, to watch out for the glitch, what I recommend that you do is what you see me do now. I did all of my work on a separate uh, thing, either separate software, or I might actually recommend that you write down on with a pen and paper that you take a picture of. And um, basically your act of uploading it to here, it shouldn't take you too long. B basically there shouldn't be a lot of information here that you could potentially lose if you get kicked out of here. And you know, if you do get kicked out, you just come back and re-enter what you had before. But uh, avoiding that in the first place would be what I would recommend. So, yeah. And uh, if uh, in cases like this, um, where I recognize an error, I might highlight more clearly that I've, I'm making a, oh yeah, I did actually correct the answer. So it's easier for the grader to see. So, so that's the demonstration of the timed assessment. Um, guess I have a choice uh, between, so I could do the multiple choice timed assessment one more time, or I could maybe do one question out of the problems at nine. Any preferences of the people who are here? You can put in the chat, whether it's private or public message. I think if I don't hear any particular preference, I might just do the multiple choice timed assessment one more time. Uh, I think uh, we don't have any need uh, for another one. So can you do the multiple choice? Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. I'm happy to do that. And it's actually easier for me. So this time I'm just going to speed run it. I'm not going to explain things. I'll just uh, answer them because uh, I'm sure it, or I think I can do it that way in less than uh, maybe even within the remaining time. Let's see. I don't know. The, the one other thing is I um, have you know a lot of these questions I've written, so I have them memorized. That actually hurts a little bit <laughs> in terms of yeah. So I, just looking at the diagram, I know oh this is the setup where they're rolling and they're gonna uh, go up. Okay, as they roll, which roll up farther on the incline. Um, the main point here is that this ring has more energy to start out with. They're moving at the same speed, then uh, this has greater rotational inertia, therefore greater rotational kinetic energy. So at the very end, where everything is potential energy, this will have uh, end up at higher height because it has a greater initial kinetic, initial uh, total kinetic energy. So the ring rolls up to higher height because it has greater <laughs> rotational kinetic energy, which is consistent with this. Okay, question two, two objects fall under Force of gravity. Uh, let me see if this will give me words. It doesn't. Yeah, yeah. One is a rod, one people did by people. Uh, a lot fall from rest at the same time. Um, yeah, which correctly describe dynamics. Okay. So it's uh, describing uh, all like, well, really doesn't fit in. Okay, well, I hope that kind of makes sense. Um, so the rod, when it, um, this goes to stable, unstable equilibrium, the rod is in unstable equilibrium, it will fall over. Um, it, it Small fluctuations initially will just cause it to eventually fall over. So this is not correct because it's an unstable equilibrium. Uh, still, I saved the mass, no translation, okay, I'm just going to move larger than the total. 
Oh yeah, this is um, so. What this is basically getting at is, you know, when you look at the total um, initial energy, the stable actually has more energy because its center of mass is here. The center of mass of the rod is it's at its center. So the, the gravitational energy that potential energy that the rod starts out with is actually less. So the still ball will have, because it starts out with a greater initial energy, its uh, final uh, total kinetic energy will be greater than the total kinetic energy of the rod. Um, and uh, does, uh, yeah, you, you can break it into motion of center of mass and rotation about center of mass. That's always possible. I think I mentioned that in lecture. Um, still will fall to the more. So. Oh, yeah. this is a tricky one. Um, if you actually work it out in detail, you will find that the end point of the rod actually moves faster than speed of this. So one of those things where, you know, with a long rigid body, how fast the end point moves doesn't necessarily have a strong mechanical connection with how much energy the thing has. Uh, so yeah, I'll leave that there. If you're interested, you know, work it out. You will see that, oh, it moves faster. It's interesting. And then move on, okay. I think I've seen this question before. So yeah, rotational kinetic energy, and I answered this as the answer. So I'll just <laughs> answer the same thing. I've seen this before. Um, sometimes you will get the same question twice, uh, like with this one, I think. Uh, do uh, read through the question because some questions have multiple versions. So they might start out with the same text, but uh, some of the choices might have changed. So you know, this is uh, talking about precession, Choose the statement which most correctly describes. And um, yeah, it, this is the choice that was corrected before, and it still is. The rest are, you know, this is just nonsense. And um, yeah, okay, five minutes. I gotta go faster. Helico yeah, so this is a slightly different version of the other helicopter question. The main rotor, there's another rotor here. And Helicopter body will tend to rotate in the opposite direction. The blade, uh, Newton's third law, the action reaction. So the the motor of the helicopter applies an action torque on the rotor. There's a reaction torque on the helicopter that tends to rotate it the opposite way. Um, so, oh, uh, I guess that could happen. Yeah. All right. This question I've answered before. Two main blades. They spin in opposite directions so that the counter torque on their chin up from one rotor and the other rotor, they will balance each other. Um, yeah, symmetrical plane so has nothing to do with those. Okay. Um, yeah, this question, <laughs> because I don't have as many uh, static equilibrium questions, you do have greater chance of seeing the static equilibrium question. What? So I think, uh, yeah, it was this one um, that was correct answer so last time. <laughs> and what, what it is. What's the difference between those two? Are they not identical? Oh, uh, you mean the third and the fourth? Yeah. Ah, they are different in that this is square root uh, goes over my, uh, this r minus h. I see now. Here it doesn't, yeah. Attention to detail. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it, uh, and, and they are deliberately constructed this way because here, here, uh, the unit won't work out, but here the unit will work out uh, so that the total unit is Newton. This uh, combined to a unitless combination um, with the correct ending point for the square root. So, tall box resting, okay, enough friction, coefficient, hold up, okay, increase on which statement. So it explains most. Oh, I think this is, I explained this in one of the videos that you can watch. So I'm just gonna answer it. The answer is um, yeah, clockwise torque due to gravity decreases. So here, the gravitational force is providing clockwise torque. That um, as it is tilts, the uh, gravity as gravity is right over this point, it's providing zero torque. And when it's over on the other side, it's not providing counterclockwise torque. And I think uh, I'm not too far off in describing it as clockwise torque decreasing. Yeah. At least uh, it's a least incorrect answer. Um, okay, constant gravitational force between Earth and an apple that falls from tree, evaluate the balance and choose the incorrect statement. Uh, 
Uh, the acceleration is not equal. So, oh, so that is incorrect. Okay, that's it. Uh, let me just quickly check the rest. Magnitude, yeah. It, ma the magnitude of the forces are equal. That's Newton's third law. Um, acceleration of the apple due to gravity force on the apple is, yeah, it is greater, smaller mass, same force, greater acceleration. Newton's the second law. Um, yeah, I think this is another version of Newton's third law. Okay, um, oh, which is, uh, I guess uh, there's a bit of an interest in that the Newton's law of universal gravitation without explicitly appealing to Newton's third law, it's consistent with the Newton's third law. And that's uh, the feature that you will continue to see for all the fundamental forces or laws of nature, that they have to be consistent with the Newton's third law. If they're not, then we have a serious problem. Yeah, astronauts in orbit around the weightlessness. Yeah, this is sometimes called referred to as microgravity. It's not really weightlessness. It's the feeling of weightlessness, um, like a zero g flight. And what it is? Yeah, the only force acting on them is gravitational force. I think uh, I uh, mentioned this in one of the early lectures about the forces. The only forces that you ever feel are. Uh, contact the forces. So when I'm sitting in my chair, I feel my weight because of the support forces from the chair, which is affecting my muscles and whatnot. That's how I'm feeling the force. If I'm in free fall, I won't really feel gravitational force. Like I will accelerate according to gravitational force, but like the way my muscles tense up, like it's not reflected in uh, how much gravitational force is on me. So that's the correct statement. The rest are wrong. Astronauts are not actually that far, especially if they're in orbit around the Earth. Um, yeah, so submit an answer. I hope I didn't miss anything. <laughs> Never know, I might have missed something. Okay, good. So that's it. Uh, that's uh, two um, kind of versions of questions. I think that between those two attempts, you might have seen a little under half the questions. Um, which I assume helps, <laughs> but you know, um, to do understand why the correct answers are correct, uh, not just to memorize the <laughs> answers and questions you see.